The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Hippie Universe Coast Anthem, What's Likely to Change. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with Digital Business Law Group. We're going to um, jump right in here and um, get to the heart of the matter. And I, and, and I believe uh, watching the market for the last five years, what's going to happen after Anthem? And Anthem, if, 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 if some of you don't know, is uh, an insurer that had an $83 million uh, record breach. Okay, this is the probably this is probably the biggest breach um, in history uh, so far, and but we've had big breaches before, and so by and large, uh, the the landscape is not likely to change except except for there's definitely going to be more pressure on HHS to act, and by acting, I mean enforce okay there's going to be more lawsuits uh, and there's going to be more complaints more complaints from uh, patients we can expect that there's clearly going to be more class action lawsuits we've already had I believe three or four that have been filed against against anthem and you can be sure that anytime there is a major breach there's going to be class action lawsuits what is really odd more than odd is is the silence from HHS on the Anthem breach. Not only the silence of HHS, but in fact, um, Anthem, in, in its infinite wisdom, has refused to cooperate with uh, the Office of uh, what is it, OIG, the general, it's an investigative office. I lost it for a second there. Anyway, it's the legal arm. It's an investigative arm of the government. And essentially what OIG wanted to do was they wanted to go in and scan Anthem's networks to try and determine what Anthem's vulnerabilities might have been. Okay, and because it was such a large breach, um, the government clearly had, clearly had a, a lot of interest in trying to figure out what's going on. You know, is this is this another China attack? Is it a Russia Russian attack? You, you know, so with a breach this large, our government definitely is is interested. Now, what happened though? Um, on the way to the investigation is that Anthem essentially refused. They told OIG, no, we have internal policies and procedures and we don't allow anyone in to search our networks. And basically stopped OIG cold from going in. Now that that's that's fact number one that Anthem would do that, which means that they probably got a team of lawyers or teams of lawyers that say, you know what, your better position is to delay right now, obfuscate, and just don't, you know, we'll do our own internal investigation. We don't need a lot of um, outsiders, especially, especially federales, poking around and and what happened here. That's number one. I don't, I don't believe I've heard of any. HHS activity with respect to Anthem, and that's curious. So the so the the silence is deafening, really, around the Anthem breach, and it leads you to ask, and what what is really going on here? So that's what we're going to try to deal with today, all right? And and we're going to talk about lawsuits and complaints and things like that. But what we're what we're going to try to do is really cut through what is really happening in the marketplace, what HHS is really doing on the ground. Uh, we know that audits appear to be deferred again. Um, so anecdotally, you know, the visibility of HHS actually enforcing 
of the High Tech Act regulations, the omnibus rule, uh, uh, there appears to be very little enforcement at all. Sure, they have to enforce and they have to investigate when there's a major breach, but as far as I know, uh, I haven't heard of any HHS launching an audit against Anthem. Now, you know, they may have launched it in silence, and sometimes these things take a year, a year and a half before they report out. But I'm just going to throw it out there to, um, to the people that are attending here. Does anyone know of any news around an HHS investigation of Anthem? And you can kind of raise your hands through the chat um, if you want to contribute. So here's the curious thing about Anthem, is that the OIG stated that in what it was able to access and investigate. Now remember, Anthem just told the OIG, you can't come in. We're not going to let you in. We're not going to let you access our network. That's our, our, our internal policies and procedures. And you know, even though you're part of the government, we're not going to let you in. But the OIG then comes out with a statement that says there was no reason to believe that WellPoint is not in compliance with the HIPAA security, privacy, and national provider identifier regulations. And the question is, how could OIG possibly make a statement like that if they weren't allowed in to do the kind of uh, network scan that they wanted to do? So th this is the first I've heard of OIG being involved in a breach. Right, so there's some questions there. Why, 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 why isn't HHS, uh, you know, doing this? And then, how can OIG be denied access and then claim that uh, that the provider? And it's interesting here this, that the WellPoint uh, and Anthem um, link here is a little unclear. Now that I look, I look at the quote, but this is from an article, um, actually from our LinkedIn group uh, that I got. So. Um, it's it's curious, let's just say that, that HHS is really silent on this matter. And I'm just going to pause right now and see if anybody's got any any questions or any insights or that can add to the conversation about what you think may be going on here. There is nothing along those lines, uh, Carlos. There is a, a question if personal information was compromised, but no EPHI was compromised, why would HHS get involved? Yes, yeah, I think there's some question as to whether it, whether or not PHI was compromised. It seemed to me, um, from my review, that it was, that there was PHI that was compromised. It was medical records, and there, I, I believe there was names, identifiers, um, and so I, I, I looked at that, I didn't look at it today, but I looked at it when the Anthem breach was first announced and it was like, oh, that's curious, this just this looks like BHI to me. You got a name and other identifiers and you got medical information, you know, that, I mean, why, why is this not PHI? So that, that, yeah, that's a huge question, you know, and, 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 and maybe that's, um, that's what Anthem is doing. They're trying to pre prepare their defense. You know, no, this really wasn't PHI, and then, and then if it really wasn't PHI, then you're right. Then HHS would would uh, would not be playing here. Um, but there are some things um, that are likely to change, I believe. But they're going to be they're going to change for the real, real, the really big players in this space. And everybody knows that there's about 150 years of change going on in healthcare right now in five, right? There's the move to electronic health records, ICD-10 is coming up, telemedicine, pay for performance, on and on and on, right? And the industry, there's a lot of consolidation going on. So there's a lot of mom and pop uh, healthcare providers that are folding into bigger clinics, and that's likely to continue. So. HHS is, is likely um, out of necessity because of the breach notification rule to deal with big players when 
big players have a breach. So breach notification is really the 800-pound gorilla here. And anytime you get something like Anthem, you get a lot of press, it raises a lot of questions, right? Now, I got to tell you anecdotally, there's been a lot of questions out there about HHS not enforcing. And for those of you who um, have been practicing HIPAA compliance before the High Tech Act came out in 2009, you know the dirty little secret was that HIPAA was unenforced. The biggest fine you could get was $25,000. Almost nobody ever got audited. And as long as you had a notice of privacy practices and you had some kind of feel-good training, you were OK. Or you thought you were OK. But the bottom line is you were OK because there was never anybody that vetted it. It wasn't enforced. And so the question now is, are we going to see selective enforcement from HHS? In other words, are they going to let the small to medium-sized guys take a pass, okay, and only focus on big name breaches like Anthem to send a message that that you got to do something? Because as far as I can tell, there's been very very little movement from, let's say, the masses of small providers, business associates, clinics, to comply. Right? Even despite the fact that there are competitive solutions out there that could help you uh, without breaking the bank, it still takes time for your administrator to learn the security rule and how to conduct a risk assessment. And you know, if you added all that up, and you maybe you got to build, maybe you got to buy a little software hire a consultant, if you added all that up, you probably can't do that for less than ten or $15,000, right? I mean, somewhere in that ballpark, including staff time. And a lot of small providers have just said, you know what? We're not going to comply. And I don't know now if that's a crazy strategy. But, I mean, you can do something cost effectively for a lot less money. Right, and in fact, we sell products in the space. We sell a subscription plan for seven ninety five. But those are tools and templates that will help you, but they will only help you to the extent that you actually use them. Right, despite the fact that we have a um, checklist, a security rule checklist that walks you through how to do a risk assessment, and and the requirement from the security rule is not to do the best risk assessment; it's to do a risk assessment. And if you hadn't had a breach and you did a risk assessment, but it wasn't the best risk assessment in the world, you're probably outside of willful neglect land. Okay, so there's a lot of things that small providers could do, but for some reason, culturally, you right because some of these old docs remember HIPAA schmipa, you know, I'd rather retire, go to jail, I'm not going to conform, and you know, for those guys that got three or four years left to practice, that's fine, but. We haven't seen a mass movement uh, of mid-sized to smaller covered entities or business associates actually try to comply in a meaningful way. Okay? And part of that could be that HHS has, uh, because the, it's because it's delayed the audits, because it took so long to get the rules out, maybe send in the message, you know what, we're just going to selectively uh, enforce here. Now, I'm going to give you another example, which is really as interesting, maybe more interesting than Anthem, is that so there's been another breach. This is after Anthem. So U.S. health insurance firm Primera Blue Cross has revealed its IT systems were breached, exposing the financial and medical records of 11 million customers. Now, let me just do the math for you from the Ponymon Institute. The Ponymon Institute says, actually, this is conservative. Okay, I'm going to use the number 200 per record. That's the cost of notification, okay, and some other costs, and maybe legal costs, and there's a bunch of factors that go into that number. But a breach of 5,000 records, which you can easily have on a thumb drive, that's a 
million dollar breach, just the notification, right? Not including the fines, class action lawsuits, and all that. So when you get into the millions of customers, you're actually looking at a going out of business strategy and because healthcare is undergoing so much change, because CMS is pushing for paper performance and transforming the industry in the industry into a really competitive marketplace, you know, there are unintended consequences. What do they do with an anthem that has a breach of eighty three million? I mean that's an astronomical number. Even if you calculated a two hundred per record, that, that, that's just such a huge number that they they would have to go out of business probably. And in fact, the Ponymon Institute says that for the healthcare industry, that's a conservative number. For the healthcare industry, it's more like 300 or something per record, per breach. Okay? And so there are some things going on behind the scenes, I believe, that uh, has led the Obama administration to say, you know what? We may want to slow down the enforcement here. Um, and that would partly explain, because people get those messages, that would partly explain why a lot of small providers or mid-sized providers have said, you know what, we're not going to mess with it. So it looks like, now this is from my perspective watching the market now for five years, it looks like it's really business as usual. The big changes are to the big guys, right? If you get, you're an Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, you're a Signet, you know, and you have a breach, then HHS has to respond in some way. And I, I, we're right now, I'm even calling the question, or, or at least posing the question, why isn't HHS involved here? It's unclear, really. It's unclear to... Uh, and if you go to our LinkedIn group, I think it's unclear to a lot of people that participate in the group as to what, you know, what is really going on here. So, to me, it, it appears like it's just business as usual. It's not, we didn't enforce it all that much prior to uh, 2009, and it looks like we're not going to enforce it all that much now, except, except for the 800-pound gorilla of breach notification. And... We've yet to see, yes, we saw, a, I believe, a county hospice, you know, fine $50,000 um, a year or so ago. And, you know, but we've yet to see, let's say, a multi-million dollar fine to a really small provider. Okay, so the small providers and mid-sized providers are, are, I believe, thinking, well, maybe we can just ride this out. Now... Here's the thing, and, you know, this is just for, you know, there's, I had a law school professor that said there's the rule, and then there's the reality of the rule, meaning, yes, there's the rule of law, and then it's how, the reality is how the rule is actually enforced by the courts, okay? And we all know that insurance, the insurance lobby is huge in Washington, <laughs> and so I'm saying that Anthem and some of these guys may be putting on pressure to HHS to say, look, this is crazy. We can't, I mean, we can't pay $200 for record for an $83 million, you know. I mean, somebody could quickly do the math, but that's in the billions of dollars, right? That's putting, you know, Anthem out of business. And so I think we're running headlong into some unintended consequences of the High Tech Act, that this is, um, as written, can lead to sort of absurd results like this. And then it'll be interesting to see how HHS handles an anthem or handles a Primera, because whatever it does, it's going to have to be proportional. So if you have an 83 million record breach, and let's just assume for the sake of argument that it is PHI, and Let's say you just find you find them for whatever HHS's infinite wisdom, five million dollars. Then you're going to have a hard time uh, finding a small provider, um, you know, any significant amount of money because of proportionality. 
Okay, so I, 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 my sense is that the HHS is really struggling with what to do with this problem. My sense is the insurance lobby is, is putting a lot of pressure uh, on HHS to sort of rethink how they're going to go about doing this and rethink audits. Now, here's the thing. The breach notification is not going to go away. The High Tech Act is not going to go away. HIPAA is not going to go away. And what the big guys, with the big companies that have a ton of exposure, yeah, they're going to be they're going to be hiring risk mitigation experts, and they're going to be hiring, uh, seeing how much coverage they can get from cyber insurance, and trying to do whatever they can to mitigate this risk. But everyone else may be kind of shut out of the game, and so we'll see. So I'm gonna, I'm going to stop there, Martin, and see if. Um, if there's any questions. Well, there was uh, one question, and actually it wasn't a question, it was an observation. The AMS, uh, Anthem's website states no EPHI was compromised. But who would know, you know? Uh, it states that uh, the P, uh, EPHI was not compromised or was? was comp no, no EPHI was compromised. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's an, that's interesting. Since nobody, since who's been in there to who's been in there to uh, verify that? That's well, the question, right? Well, that that is the question. That the that's the, the that's the that's the elephant that's the elephant in the room with this kind of breach is OIG. I think it's the Office of Inspector General. Okay, just came back. OIG wants to go in and scan. They say no. no. Sorry, we're not going to let you in. I mean, HHS, you get this kind of brief that look like it had PHI, and they don't go in and, and, and investigate at all, and they don't go in and make a statement at all. Um, so it's curious. At a minimum, it's curious as to what's going on here. Now, look, this is the, this is the, Well, the, There's a secondary commentary here. Absolutely. The Chinese just broke in to say hi. Clearly, they didn't have access to any EPHI, I believe, Anthem's lawyers. Now, I can't tell whether that's um, uh, a little bit on, on the non-belief side or the belief side. But if the Chinese did break in, they just didn't say hi. <laughs> yeah, that's a, no, I believe that was a little bit of, of clever sarcasm, right? Yeah. The Chinese broke in and they... They're just poking around, you know, they, they, or the Russians, or here's the thing, because Martin and I were just talking about this before the, um, the webinar started. So, it, you know, now you got to verify these numbers, and sometimes you got to take these numbers with a grain of salt, and as fine a job as the Ponymon Institute does with that $200 or $300 per record, it, you know, I've, I've always questioned that a little bit just because the math, that's, doesn't seem to work because at five thousand records breach is a million dollars right there, and you haven't paid you haven't paid the fines, the lawsuits, and you know blah blah blah. Although I believe they they they, they try to factor in some of that. So um, you, you know you got to take some of these numbers with, with a grain of salt. But so the word on the street is that a regular credit card financial breach, right? You get somebody's financial information, credit card name, address, blah blah blah. That's worth twenty dollars in the black market. You get somebody's PHI that happens to be richer, uh, presumably, with personal information. And, what, and what's the number, Martin? Is that is it fifty or sixty? It's sixty dollars. And if I like us, we were talking. If I was a hacker, I'd give myself a, a, a nice two hundred percent raise and and focus on where the real money was. Well, exa yeah, exactly. That's the point. They're gonna, the smart guys. Are, I mean, the bad guys are smart, right? They're going to go like, you know, where it wasn't Jesse James, but, you know, let's say it was Jesse James. Jesse, why do you rob banks? Well, because that's where the money is. You know, <laughs> that's the, they're going to target, they're going to target the big guys. So it, now there's this quandary, really, about what, what does HHS do and how does it respond, you know, and is it going to be, is, is it going to let, HIPAA be another dead letter, you know, a, a law that's not really enforced. Well, you know what? I don't think so because we don't live back in 2000, 
six and two thousand and four. Right? There's a high amount of interest in uh, cybersecurity and cybercrime. I mean, it's all over the press. Essentially, the world that we live in, this 24/7, 365 online world. In that world, privacy and security's got to get better. That issue is not going to go away. So HHS is not going to have the luxury of of not enforcing. Now, from I mean, it, everyone should know this, but um, under HIPAA itself, it's only HHS and state attorney generals that can bring an action on behalf of individuals. So HIPAA and, and high tech didn't really modify this. HIPAA provides no private right of action. There's no cause of action under HIPAA for an individual to sue either a covered entity or a business associate. Okay, so, you know, I get called all the time. Somebody did something, you know, with my HIPAA record and my privacy. It was like, you know, under HIPAA, really all you can do is file a complaint with HHS or file a complaint with your state AG. Okay, and they can bring an action. Now, obviously, the HHS is not going to bring an action. The state AG is not going to bring an action unless there's a big target. That's just the way it works. There's a finite amount of resources. So, you know, you, you, were, the, you were the only one uh, whose record got breached with this small health care provider. Eh, you know, HHS may not act on that, except, except for this little-known fact, I think that in the complaint, if, HH, if HHS determines that on its face the facts of the complaint demonstrate willful neglect, then HHS is mandated, required to audit. Okay? Now, what would, what would qualify as willful neglect on its face? Well, we already have an example. Two or three years ago, Signet got fined 14 $4.3 million. Why? Because they refused to provide PHI to about 19 patients. The patients obviously understood that it was their right under HIPAA to ask for the PHI, and Signet, in its infinite wisdom, just said, no, no, we're not going to give it to you. And enough of those patients filed complaints, you know, and Signet refused to cooperate with HHS and wound up getting fined $4.3 million. And I think Signet went rogue for other reasons and probably went out of business. But uh, you, a, 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 an angry patient, you know, that's angry because they didn't get their uh, PHI could bring a complaint and could trigger an audit. The likelihood of that happening and a breach happening it's orders of magnitude higher than the likelihood that you're going to be selected as one of the, I don't know what, how many, I don't think HHS has announced it, but what, a thousand audits it's going to do, that would be a lot. And they keep delaying those audits, right? So the real risk is a patient complaint or a breach. That's what you really have to worry about. And now there's these other lawsuits that you got to worry about it as well from the perspective of liability. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there and just see if anybody's got any questions at all. Um, not at this time. Let me just ask for a show of hands if if people are inter uh, not interested if people understand what happened or are aware of the Walgreens case. Just kind of raise your hands. Because Walgreens is a very, very important case that happened recently. Um, and it's important for reasons that we're uh, about to discuss. Okay, so the, the Walgreens case was, Walgreens was actually fined, and I, I can't remember exactly what the judgment was, but it was... Um, it was over a million, I think it may have been uh, like a million four, and it was fined a million four because of the wrongful acts of its of a particular pharmacist, okay? 
Now, the surprising thing is that in the past, a wrongful act on the part of an employee did not impute liability to the employer. Okay, so Walgreens, the Walgreens case at 1.4 million, and it was upheld, was a groundbreaking case and, and, and uh, rightfully scared uh, big employers, and they're gonna try to do things to mitigate that. So here's what you can do, individual complaints under HIPAA. So under HIPAA, only two things, right? File a complaint with HHS, or file a complaint with state attorney general. That's all you can do. That's it. That's the scope of your rights. Class actions. So if individuals can't bring lawsuits under HIPAA, how come every time there's a major breach, we see all these class actions? Okay. So the class actions are brought under really two theories. Some state breach law that allows the action or negligence. Okay. And I think more and more the cause of action in this class act in, in these class action lawsuits is going to be under a theory of negligence. So what can individuals do? Well, they can do the same thing. They could bring an action, even though HIPAA says you can't bring an action, you, you know, you should know that if a state law regarding EPHI is more stringent than HIPAA, then you have to comply with HIPAA and the state law, okay? And obviously the states know this, right? Because that's what they that's what they do. If a state law is less stringent than HIPAA, then HIPAA would occupy the space, and for all intents and purposes, the state law would be null and void. So the state legislators know this, and so if they're going to implement um, laws around EPHI, they're going to make them more stringent, okay? And so they may allow some causes of action for individuals. So there may be a state breach law or a, or a negligence law. So both for individual and for class actions, these are two ways that you could bring a lawsuit, even though HIPAA itself does not provide you that right. So, and we've already seen a lot of these suits. I, I, I mean, I don't remember the number exactly, but I think three or four class actions have already been filed against Anthem. Okay, and so what do you have to prove to prove negligence? Well, really, it's got four elements, right? You've got to prove duty, that the covered entity or BA had a legal duty to protect the patient's PHI. Well, HIPAA clearly establishes that duty. That's, that's, that's easy. That's, that, that's a no-brainer. And moreover, there's a lot of courts that have already held that HIPAA is the standard for establishing the duty. Okay? Then the question is, well, did you breach the duty? That the CE or BA breached the standard of care. So what's the standard of care here? Standard of care are the HIPAA regulations. In other words, if you didn't do what you were supposed to do under HIPAA, well, then you breached the standard of care. Okay? And did that breach cause the patient harm? Now, you know, a lot of class actions have... This is where they run into roadblocks because some courts have said, ah, we don't see the harm. You know, the fact that you've got to go fix all your, um, you know, credit cards, and you know, but other courts are starting to find harm, okay? And obviously, now the, the facts around Walgreens were really specific, so we'll talk, we'll talk about that, but you, you got to find that, that this third element, that the breach caused the patient some harm, usually in, in money, right? And there, there were damages, that the harm caused the breach resulted in damages to the patient. And we resulted in the patient essentially losing money, right? You gotta prove these four elements. And yes, causation, this can be split into two, two elements, but really this is negligence one one And HIPAA has never prevented a negligence suit, okay? But more and more people now, because they're because more and more people are becoming aware of their rights under HIPAA, and more and more lawyers are understanding that they can bring an action under negligence. You're going to see a lot more actions here, right? And you could see actions against small providers, even though HHS, you know, for whatever reasons, may not be looking to enforce against small providers.
So, bottom line is you got to, all four elements must be satisfied for the patient to prevail. What's the standard of care? Right? So, the standard of care is inextricably intertwined with the first two elements. What's the duty, and what that duty breach? Right? And so, the standard of care represents the measure of the duty owed. What, what was the covered entity, what duty did the covered entity business associate owe to the patient? And also, the standard of care, it's the standard of care um, that governs if a breach can be established. In other words, if you didn't do what was required of you in the standard of care, then you breached. Okay? Now, I can tell you that probably over 90%. Big and small covered entities and business associates don't have a full HIPAA compliance program implemented. And therefore, it's not going to be hard to establish, A, that there was a duty, because if there's a duty by default, HIPAA establishes the duty, B, that the duty was breached, and then the question becomes not so much causation, you know, because I think causation can be said, but damages. What are the damages? How did this hurt patients? So here, breach means a failure to satisfy the duty as defined by the standard of care. So if we're going back to what are we going to see post-anthem, uh, you know, I don't see a lot of HHS enhanced enforcement because I haven't seen it for five years, and that's how long the High Tech Act has been out there. Yes, they drug their feet on the omnibus rule, and, you know, they, they finally got around to doing it in 2013, but... These kinds of issues is where the liability is going to come from. So lots of courts have held that HIPAA can be used as the standard of care in PHI negligence actions. And this isn't this is even post the High Tech Act. You got courts in a number of states uh, that have held this way, including recently this uh, the uh, Connecticut Supreme Court in this particular case held that HIPAA could be the standard of care. Okay, so now, it's, now this is becoming more or less settled law. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there because I know we're we're covering some legal questions and see if anybody's got anything they'd like to ask. Martin, are you still here? Yes, nothing concerning a breach of or cause of action. Okay, so what happened in Walgreens? So Walgreens was a case that, the, that HIPAA was used as a standard of care, okay? But that doesn't turn out to be the big deal in Walgreens. The big deal in the Walgreens case was actually something different. So what was it? So respondeat superior, the Latin phrase. What does it mean? Well, what? Well, well, what it means is let the man, let the master answer for the employee. Okay, more or less paraphrasing. But Walgreens was the Walgreens case was surprising uh, because respondeat superior, or whether we're going to find an employer liable, is usually something that's determined as a matter of law. Now that's just a a um, term of art that means that the judge determines that, not the jury. Okay. But in the Walgreens case, the judge actually led, led, let respondeat superior go to the jury and let the jury decide whether or not Walgreens should be liable in addition to the pharmacist. So you had a pharmacist whose boyfriend, um, who had a boyfriend who had an ex, and this particular pharmacist, female pharmacist, was spying on the X, what kind of scripts was the X getting, et cetera, et cetera. So those, those are the basic uh, facts. And, um, and the circuit court uh, in the Walgreen, Walgreens case, the appeals court upheld it. So respondeat superior resulted in a $1.4 million judgment against Walgreens, not only against Walgreens, but against the pharmacist as well. But you know, the pharmacists, pharmacists don't make this kind of money, so the, what the pharmacist is going to do is probably file bankruptcy and say, hey, I'm done, 
right? So it's going to be Walgreens that winds up paying the judgment. So where do we go from here? Well, you know, I think it's too early to tell, but I, I, I don't expect super aggressive enforcement from HHS. What I expect is liability to rise because of negligence suits, class action suits, complaints that show willful neglect on, on its face, those sorts of things, not from some sort of strong arm enforcement from HHS, you know, because we haven't seen it. We haven't seen it, and I don't think we're going to see it. So damages, in, in, especially in class actions, damages have historically been a bar to mega class action suits. But now some courts are starting to allow for these kinds of damages, you know, the amount of time it takes to go cancel all your credit cards. And, you know, all that is really, um, if anybody's ever had to do that, you know it's a royal pain. You know that it can take hours and hours and hours to fix all that. And, you know, and, and the companies that you have to deal with aren't necessarily all that willing to help you fix stuff. So, you know, because of, because the courts are, are starting to be more open to those kinds of damages, it, it's going to propel a lot more class action litigation and maybe even litigation on the part of individuals. Okay. Here's the thing, though that you can, you can potentially eliminate 95% of the liability despite being only 5% compliant. Okay? And huh? But well, I mean, what does that mean? How, do you, how can you eliminate 95% of the liability despite being only 5% compliant? So one of the things that happened after Anthem uh, in our LinkedIn group and in other places was a discussion of whether or not Anthem should have encrypted all its records, okay, assuming that there was EPHI, and we know they're now claiming it wasn't EPHI, okay, but let's, let's just take, even if it wasn't Anthem, uh, Primera, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, 11 million records, okay. Um, under HIPAA, if you encrypt according to the NIST standards, then there can't be a breach by definition because the assumption is that those algorithms can't be compromised. Okay, so as long as you can prove that you encrypted your data at rest, which is mostly what hackers are getting access to, right? They're not like tapping into the wire and, you know, getting SMS messages. That they're, they're breaking into your network where, you're, where, you, where your data resides in file servers, databases, etc. Okay, that's data at rest. If you could encrypt all that, then you could take advantage of the safe harbor, okay? And there was a lot of discussion about whether or not you should encrypt. And here's the thing, you know, about, well, it's probably six months ago now, some of the leading lights, some of the leading CIOs um, at, a, at a privacy and security conference were being quite open about you are not going to be able to stop no matter how strong you think your perimeter is, perim perimeter protection is, you can almost be guaranteed that somebody's going to be able to break your perimeter. Okay, so just you know, just focus in on your proxy server and all that kind of stuff. To, look, it's not it's not enough. And what these CIOs are saying is, no. Look, going forward, you have to assume that these Chinese hackers or these Russian hackers are going to penetrate your perimeter. And then the question is, what do, you, what do you do in response? Okay? Well, the most practical thing you could do is encrypt. Because then there, if they find this encryption, look, if a particular bank is really, really hard to rob because it's got all this security and a three-foot metal, you know, vault, and, you know, the smart bank robbers are just going to go to the next bank, okay? And so my perspective is, look, yes, there may be some complexity in encrypting, granted, but it's getting easier. And, the, yes, the IT guys are going to point back, and they're going to say, oh, it's going to be so slow. Our docs are going to 
But the reality is, is that Microsoft, Oracle, all these guys that the database vendors are getting better and better at their encryption because they know they have to play in this space. Okay, they know they got to deliver solutions to financial institutions, healthcare institutions that can satisfy this encryption requirement. Okay, so from my perspective, it's just flat stupid not to invest in encryption. So my example here is, let's say that you encrypted everything, you know, but you you know you hadn't done a risk assessment. Well, you're going to get clobbered for that, but. You, you know, you didn't really have your policies and procedures in place. And, you know, yeah, you're going to get slapped on the wrist. Maybe there's willful neglect because you should do at least, you know, a risk assessment even if it's a bad one. But just by encrypting, you've eliminated 95% of the liability even though you're really just complying with 5% of the security rule. Okay? So that, there's a, my point here is there's a difference between liability and compliance. And... As we all know, healthcare budgets are stressed, and you know compliance doesn't rank high on where the money goes. Right? It's a necessary evil. It's a nuisance. And so every organization is going to have to make trade-offs, economic trade-offs, on where they're going to focus, and that's going to come down to practical decisions. One practical practical decision that everybody should make is encrypt. The other one is that everybody should make and that almost no one is doing is don't allow PHI to be stored on mobile devices, telephone, pads, you know, all PDAs, all, don't allow it. Those mobile devices, laptops, those mobile devices are easily stolen, lost. Those should be access only devices. Okay, that's another common sense thing you could do. Centralize your ePHI, encrypt it, and only make mobile devices be access only. Now, is that really happening in the industry? Absolutely not, because the docs want everything. They want the new toys, and everybody wants stuff on their phone, and they ask for it, and they get it, right? Because in the healthcare industry, the docs rule. They're at the top of the pecking order. So anyway, that's, that's what was meant by eliminating liability, even though you're not complying with most of the rules. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, based on your comments, Carlos, do you think anyone is reconsidering the damaging damages levels that high tech brought to HIPAA? Maybe taking a claw or two without recreating the paper tiger? I, I'm not sure that it's, um, yeah, I'm not sure that I, I um, completely understand the import. I, I, I think. I think it's definitely not a paper tiger anymore, but primarily because the breach notification is the 800-pound gorilla, right, that you're going to have to report if you have a breach. And, and if you have all this PHI floating around on mobile devices, it's not if you're going to have a breach, it's when. Because somebody's going to lose the laptop, somebody's going to lose the phone, somebody's going to find it, and there's going to be PHI on it, right? And that could have been prevented and wasn't, right? And, you man, you can easily have 5,000 records of PHI on, on uh, an iPad or any other tablet or on a phone. Uh, so yes, I don't think I don't think we're going back to the paper tiger, but I think the claw the claw that covered entities and business associates should be aware of is that that a lot of the liability may not be coming from where they think it was coming from, i.e. HHS that the liability may be coming from class action suits, individual suits under negligence theory, uh, complaints that show willful neglect on its face. Because I I, um, I would venture to guess, guess that there's been a huge, after the High Tech Act, there's been a huge uh, interest, rightfully so, in the security rule. And people, by and large, have ignored, to a certain degree, the privacy rule, thinking that, well, all they need for the privacy rule is their notice of privacy practices, as long as they get that signed when people come in. But, but how many organizations out there have mature processes for providing patients PHI within 30 days? Let me get, let me get a raise of hand. So everybody's anonymous here. How many people have mature processes and have specific individuals identified and trained to do that? Okay, 
And you could ask the same question for amendments to PHI. How many organizations have people specially trained to deliver that? And so we call those sections from section 164.520 of the privacy rule to 164.528, we call it the patient's bill of rights because essentially there's some due process requirements that you have to comply with. Uh, you just, if, if a patient asks you for PHI, you don't get to do it like any old time you see you get ready or see fit to do it. You got you have to do it in 30 days. And if you don't do it in 30 days, you have to write, you have to provide the patient a written explanation as to why you can't do it in 30 days. And in that written explanation, you have to tell the patient when you are going to deliver, okay? And there are these other requirements that you have to follow. Uh, and yes, historically, because because the healthcare industry was living in the 19th century, and having everything on paper, not very many people asked. It was never a problem. But two things are happening. A, the industry has moved in a big way to electronic health records in mass, right? So, I mean, there was a big movement because of, uh, of the meaningful use dollars that were available uh, to do that. And patients, have now become more educated, right? The whole e-patient -E movement and all that, they're becoming more uh, empowered, not only based, empowered based on what they know about their privacy and security rights, but empowered as to participating in their own treatments, okay? Um, because nobody knows my body better than me, right? And our, our bodies send us signals, and we gotta participate because you know, oftentimes you go to the doctor and you get five minutes with the doctor, okay? And so so people are, are beginning to take more responsibility, rightfully so, for their own health, they become better educated, they understand that, you know, that the that, that, uh, that, that PHI is now being uh, digitized, you're going to have a lot more people asking for their PHI. So let me take a break here and ask if there's any questions. Um, well, before I get to the break, I'll answer the percentage question on how many people. It's uh, less than 5% have uh, you know, it's privacy practices and follow the guidelines. Less than 5% have mature processes for providing. Yes. Um, right. That, I mean, that, that intuitively, anecdotally, that's, that's what I would expect, that the privacy rule that the privacy rule has largely been been ignored, but but what what a lot of covered entities and, and business associates don't understand is there can't be a breach if there's not a violation of the privacy rule. So the first step in identifying whether a particular incident is a breach or not, the first question you have to ask is was there a violation of the privacy rule, right? And the second question you have to ask, it's, it's, the first part is, is a two-part question, and if the answer to that is yes, but was the PHI encrypted according to NIST? Okay, if you, can, if, you can, if you can answer no, there was no violation of the privacy rule, then you don't have a breach. If you can say yes, it was encrypted according to NIST, then you don't have a breach, and then you stop the rest of the analytical framework, you know, and I can tell you that Majority of the organizations, maybe a, a few at the top, don't have uh, a breach notification framework, are probably not tracking security incidents in a way that they should be. In fact, that would be one of my first questions that I would walk in. If I were an auditor, I would say, tell me who your privacy officer is, okay? Because if you don't have a named privacy officer, that's a requirement of the privacy rule. Tell me who your security officer is. Uh, tell me how you track incidents. What group or what individual is responsible for it? You know, if you see an incident, who, you, who do you report it to, right? And if I see that deer in the headlights look from the person on the other side of the table, uh, you know, I know they're in deep trouble, right? Because how can you report breaches if you're not tracking incidents? So, I mean, this is, the, this is, um, this is just the problem, the conundrum that the industry faces, okay? And, Somehow we have to figure out some way where 
doing nothing is not acceptable anymore. You're going to get fined for willful neglect, and those willful neglect fines start at 50000 per violation. And there isn't a max of $1.5 million. That $1.5 million max is for identical violations. So if you have 10 different violations, take 1.5 and multiply it by 10, okay? And we already saw Signet got fined $4.3 million, so we know the max is not 1.5, okay? So how are we going to uh, progress here and get and get the masses doing something, you know, putting some things in place, and you know, not breaking the bank at, at the same time? So that's that's the challenge. Um, and Martin, if you don't have any questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna just move on to the shameless plug and wrap up here. I have three. Uh, do you think HHS will address HIEs because of these breaches? Well, HIEs are business associates by definition, um, by definition in the High Tech Act. Okay, High Tech Act signaled HIEs as being business associates. So definitely, right? You're using an HIE, and here's the thing, right? Here's what's happening is so healthcare is transforming into a pay for performance model, a population health model, a wellness model. Well, in order to deal with wellness and population health, you need a lot of data. Well, where are you going to get the data, right? And you have accountable care organizations that are these loosely coupled organizations that HHS is, and CMS is experimenting with. But one of the things they're going to have to do is collect all this data, and where are they going to get it? Well, you know, one place they're going to get it is from the HIEs. Um, and are the HIEs liable? Yes. Right? They're liable as business associates because any business associate – is, is now liable under the High Tech Act for the privacy rule, the security rule, uh, and the breach notification rule. I mean, they're liable under the statute. They're also liable under the contract between the business associate, the covered entity, and the business associate. So, yeah, so fundamental principle number one is if you're using an HIE, you better have a business associate agreement with, with that HIE because they're a business associate. Two, yeah, they're going to be held accountable, but what, you know, what, uh, uh, some some ACO executives are saying, okay, that may be all well and good, but, you know, how are we going to fire our HIE? And there's not a good answer to that, right? Because the HIE is the organization that you're now counting on, relying on to get you all this data that you need to, to do population health. And so there's no easy way to fire your HIV, right? And so uh, uh, there's lots of things uncertain about this entire space, and I, and I, I don't think we're going to get to certainty anytime soon. Now, I don't think we're going to see more legislation. I don't, I don't think no one's talking about repealing the High Tech Act. No one's talking about a paper tiger HIPAA anymore. I mean, those days are over. We're moving forward. But we're moving forward in really uncertain waters, right? These, these are waters that we haven't navigated. And so uh, so there's a potential, a lot of liability coming from a lot of different places. Okay. <clears throat> My questions have uh, escalated somewhat, so the shameless plug, we have to wait for a little bit. Um, okay. Let's see. If a health healthcare staff member faxes one patient's progress notes to the wrong number and it ends up at a car dealership, is that reportable? Yeah, that's absolutely a, 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 a breach because it Okay, here here's the analytical framework, okay? And we have a breach notification framework. I'm I'm gonna boil it down to three steps. We are to, we already talked about the first question that you gotta answer. Right? What was the private? Well, the first question is: Is was is this does this incident, assuming that you're tracking incidents, does this incident involve a system that contains PHI? Well, if it doesn't contain PHI, there may be some violation of some other law, but there's no violation of HIPAA, right? But assuming it's a system that contains PHI, you want to say, okay, so was there a violation of the privacy rule? Right? That's question number one. And then you got to ask yourself, well, how do you know that there's a violation? In our breach notification framework, we, we provide about 12 flow charts, and we walk you through how it, you determine whether or not there was a violation. 
you know, and then you got to ask yourself, okay, was was the was the PHI at rest and was it encrypted according to this, right? And say that you found out that there was a breach, uh, there, that there was uh, a violation of the privacy rule and no encryption. Okay, then you go to the second step of the framework. The second step of the framework says, are there any, do any of the three breach exceptions apply? Okay, and the omnibus rule made some modifications in this space. So you, there are three exceptions that are built into the definition of breach, and they try to they try to cover certain common scenarios. Okay, and one of them is, okay, so let's say that you fax some information or email some information to uh, who you thought was healthcare provider A, but it really turned out to be healthcare provider B. Okay, and because they're both healthcare providers and you realize your mistake and you call healthcare provider B and say, you know what, please destroy that. Uh, it wasn't meant for you and they can give you assurances that, okay, we'll destroy it. That's one of the exceptions because because both healthcare providers, A and B, are covered entities that need to comply. Okay, and so there are other um, exceptions. There's three, right? And I don't want to misquote them right now, so we'll have to do a sort of breach notification webinar so I get them exactly uh, right. We could go out and, and look at um, the source code on the HIPAA survival guide and get it, but you know, the other one is sort of like, okay, if you gave it to, like, if you, if you gave a person's chart to a nurse that wasn't a nurse that was taking care of the patient, but she got it back almost right away, you know, okay, that's an exception, all right? So the exceptions are sort of like that. But, you know, faxing PHI to a car dealer, no, that's a, that's a breach, okay? Then you move on that, and I mean, none of the exceptions are going to apply. Then you move on to the third part of the analytical framework that says, was there a low probability that the PHI was compromised? Well, you know, and the burden of proof is on is on the covered entity and on uh, the BA to prove that. A low probability, and there's a presumption of a breach. The presumption is that, no, there isn't a low probability. So you can imagine the kind of compelling case you're going to have to make, and I can assure you that if you fax it to a car dealer, you're not going to be able to make that case about a low probability because the car dealer got it and said, oh, and especially if it was a person they knew, small town, oh, John Doe's got HIV and he's dying. So the answer is yes. If you, you, if you fax it to a car dealer, that's, that's a breach by definition. Okay. Um, do you recommend having CEs audit their BAs? Ah, you know that, that that's an interesting question. Uh, to what degree? So here's what happened. Here's what the regulations say: that CEs and BAs are both responsible for mutually monitoring the contract that they sign between each other. Okay. And that if, if, if somehow in your monitoring of the contract you realize that the BA or the CE is in material breach of the contract, then you have to notify. Okay? You gotta notify HHS. All right, that's a requirement. Now that mutual monitoring of the contract does not mean mutual monitoring of the other party's operations twenty four seven, because that that's an impossibility, right? But uh, you know, you can't turn a blind eye essentially. But the question is, the question is, with respect to business associates, did you do the due diligence required to get the satisfactory assurances that you needed from the business associate that they were going to protect the PHI that you were giving them in the same way you would? Okay? And satisfactory insurances are, that's kind of like, negligence language, okay? Because here's what will happen. If you, just, if you didn't perform any due diligence, if you didn't send out a questionnaire, if you didn't have a conference call, if you didn't ask for their documentation, if you did nothing regarding trying to verify if they're complying with the rules, then I can tell you any, any 
lawyer that practices negligence, they're going to say, well, there's no possible way that this, co this covered entity got any satisfactory assurances because they didn't do anything. They don't have any visible, demonstrable evidence that they got satisfactory assurances. So the covered entities and business associates, right, because now you can have business associates and business associates, right? So these entities are going to have to decide what kind of due diligence are they going to do within their budgets so that they're, at a minimum they're not in a position where we didn't do anything because then you're going to get killed if, if not, not, not necessarily by HHS but by a negligence lawsuit because that's an easy argument to make. You, you didn't, how did you get satisfactory assurances? You didn't do anything. Okay, so there's no requirement to go out there and, and monitor operations, but there is a requirement to get satisfactory assurances. And the question is, how do you go about doing that? Okay. What would need to be recorded by privacy and security officers? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, can you can can you be more specific on? on that I, I think I, I, well, I I don't have anything up on the board now, but I think they're referring back to um, uh, breaches. If you didn't know there was a breach, uh, how could how could you report? Okay, it? Okay, all right. So let's assume that, that let's assume that that's the question, right? Look, we, we we say that we use this thing called the compliance equation. You have to have policies in place. Policies are an organization's intentions, what they intend to do, okay? And then you have to have organizational processes that underpin those policies, okay? Because otherwise, those policies are just flowery language. They don't mean anything, right? And then you have to have a way to track process results, okay? So here's an example. Here's an example. And we call that, if you, if you can do all three, if you have policies in place, you have processes in place, and you can track process results, then you have visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. But at what level, though? Well, HHS has already published their audit protocol. It's at the level of the requirement, at the individual requirement. And guess, guess how many requir individual requirements there are for the privacy rule? There are 81. Okay, now, in our privacy rule checklist, we kind of condense it a little bit because HHS's audit protocol kind of duplicates some sections, but essentially you've got to have visible demonstrable evidence that you're complying with each and every requirement if you're going to say you're complying with the privacy rule. So let me give you an example. You have this policy that says we're going to train our, all our employees once a year. We're going to provide people that uh, provide PHI to patients because that's a specialized activity. We're going to provide them specialized training, and we're going to do the same thing for uh, people that, um, you know, worry about providing amendments to, you know, so, okay, so that's your policy, okay? And then as an auditor, I would say, well, okay, that's, that's fine. Well, tell me how you go about doing that. You have classroom training. You have video training. Do you have people take a test so that you know that they passed? What's your process? for doing these things that you say that you're doing, okay? And then, you know, if they tell me about their processes, I don't know, the final thing I'm going to say is, okay, well, show me then when the last time that the entire staff got trained. I want to see the database. I want to see the spreadsheet. I want to see some evidence of process results that demonstrate to me that you're in compliance with this requirement, okay? And as an auditor, I would walk through all 81 requirements, asking you the same questions. What's the process? What are the process? I mean, what's the policy? What are the processes? And how do you track process results? So that's a big question. And that's how you, that's how you have to answer it. If you really intend to comply, you know, there's no this mystical 42 questions that you could be asked in a HIPAA audit. I mean, HHS has published their audit protocol, okay? And I think there are 81 requirements for the privacy rule. There are like 79 requirements for the security rule, and there are like 10 for the breach notification rule. Okay. Uh, so that's what you got. that's what you have to track. And you know, we, we encourage you to track all of that in the compliance repository, so you have 
a single version of the truth that you can go to when you know when an auditor shows up or, or, or when an opposing counsel wants to see you know is suing you for negligence and is asking you for all these records uh, but at least you know where where you keep them if you have them um, how do you differentiate an, an H i.e. and a healthcare clearinghouse, the former a BA and the latter a CE. Yeah, so you know the the um, the clearinghouse is it's my understanding, maybe providing some financial activity on behalf of um, covered entities and you know uh, and then EPHI to do that and they've been around for a long time and they're, they're considered right they're considered a CE right and so um, probably just because that you know they, they, when, when the legislator you know, legislators came up with HIPAA that's what you know they decided hey if you're a clearinghouse you play a big role in the space we're gonna we're gonna make you a uh, a CE, um, a HIE is really a creature of the High Tech Act. Meaningful use, interoperability, the movement to pay for performance and population health. Right, so they're two distinct sort of entities. And I think you know they 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 just said, well, healthcare clearinghouses have always been covered entities. We're not we're not going to mess with that. But these other this other animal here. This HIE, they're going to be business associates by definition, and and that's what the High Tech Act says explicitly, expressly. These guys, they're business associates. So you better have a business associate contract. So, you know, I, I don't know that they thought all that hard about the distinction. It's just that, hey, clearinghouses were always CEs, and now we got these these other guys that we know are going to be playing a role going forward. Okay, one last question before the shameless plug. And you're going to need your crystal ball for this one. When do you think OCR will have an audit plan available? Well, that's that was kind of the whole theme of this uh, webinar. Is you know they keep pushing it back. You know they, they they were mandated to come up with. I mean, audits audits are mandatory under high tech. Okay, so so HHS has to come up with a methodology, right? And a couple years ago they had. Uh, K, uh, KPMG do that uh, protocol study of 150 covered entities. I don't think they did any business associates. And then, you know, uh, HHS was supposed to take that model, refine it, and then they were going to start these audits. And you know, everybody's been waiting for the audits, right? So that's part of my point that the liability here that they're slow walking it for whatever reason, for political reasons, who knows? Okay, but they're dragging their feet on it. And you know it's yeah you know it's anybody's guess, but but audits aren't, aren't the thing that you should be most worried about. That was the other theme here. Audits are not the thing that you should be most worried about because the probability of you actually getting audited is small. The probability of you having a breach is large. The probability of some patient being really angry and filing a complaint is large. Okay, so. Yes, everybody's sort of focusing on this audit and what do we do? And we got a four hour training video, you know, on how to prepare for a security rule audit. And we got a new product coming out on how to prepare for a privacy rule audit. Probably won't be four hours, but it'll probably be close to two. And essentially what we're doing is walking through every requirement. Saying if you really want to prepare, this is how you do it. But you know, it, it, the focus is on the wrong the wrong place because that's not that's not likely where the liability is going to come from. The liability is likely going to come from some other place. Okay, are we good? We're, we're, it's time for the shameless plug before they all leave. All right, so we got, I think most of you know, we have a subscription plan that we sell for 795 a year that includes all our products, all our training products, all our checklists. We re recently introduced that security rule audit training four hours worth of training. Uh, hopefully within a month or so we're going to be coming out with a privacy rule audit uh, training based on our checklist. 
you get all our products for seventy nine seven ninety five a year, and then optionally in the second year you can renew uh, for four ninety five, and you get any new products or updates to products. So, for example, people that brought our, our bought our subscription last year, they're getting the security rule um, audit training free as part of their subscription, and they're going to get the privacy rule uh, audit training free as part of their subscription. They're going to get the breach notification audit training, right? So that's the nature of the subscription. You can um, also buy our products individually. We haven't stopped selling them individually. If you want to buy a business associate contract or breach notification framework, etc. And we're also offering, for those people that sign up for our newsletter, you can get the HIPAA Survival Guide 4th Edition free when you sign up for our newsletter. And a lot of people have been um, taking advantage of that. So we recently released audit preparation overview, you know, how should, you know, in general how you should prepare. We've uh, recently released, probably a couple months ago now, security rule audit preparation training and coming down the road to complete the, the trifecta here is going to be privacy rule audit preparation and breach notification audit preparation. And these preparations are based on HHS's audit protocol. Okay, so we map those requirements to our checklist and say, look, this is how you go about satisfying requirement by requirement and showing visible demonstrable evidence that you're complying. Okay, so we like to think that we provide the recipe, the how-to, not just the ingredients. We like to think that we provide educational products that you can start executing on day one. Um, and that's it. It's been my pleasure being with you today, Martin. If there's no other questions, then... Uh, Thank everybody for listening. See you next time. No other questions. Thank you.